Order. Good morning, everyone. I call this meeting of the Public Accounts Committee meeting to order. I would ask everyone to ensure their phones are placed on silent so we don't have interruptions. And we'll begin with introductions, starting with Mr. Goff. Good morning. Stephen Goff, MLA for Sackville Beaver Bank. MLA Suzanne Lonis Croft, Lunenburg. Joachim Strong, Halifax, Shabukto. Ian Rankin, Timberley Prospect. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Tim Houston. I'm the MLA for Pictou East. Good morning. Great to see all of you. And I'm Lenore Zan, Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. And I'm Alan McMaster, MLA for Inverness, and your chair. Um, Ms. Towers, uh, today we have uh, the Office of Immigration to uh, discuss settlement funding. And Ms. Towers, I'd like to give you a chance uh, to introduce yourself and your colleague, uh, Ms. Lay, I believe it is, and uh, provide some opening comments. OK, thank you. So I've. So first off, thank you very much for being here. It's, a, it's an excellent opportunity for us to share the information and the work that's going on at the Office of Immigration. So I'm looking forward to an exchange, not only information we can provide to you, but to talk about some of the things that we can all do as Nova Scotians on immigration. Um, first off, I've been three months as the Chief Executive Officer at Immigration. I've been at Aboriginal Affairs for over two years now. So very much, I'll try and answer your questions, but if there are particular gaps, that's very much the help because Suzanne Lay, our Executive Director, who's here with me, has been with Immigration for a couple years, may have some more specific numbers if you have a, a question. So between us, we should be able to hopefully answer all your questions or follow up as we need to. There you go for the short person. So, so um, very much I've learned in the last few months um, how hard people have been working at the Office of Immigration, but also in other provincial departments and a lot of the partners that are involved because there's a lot of players in this file. So in recent years, I, it's safe to say that this province has been increasingly assertive 
um, really looking for opportunities for bringing more people to Nova Scotia and keeping them here. So I keep getting teased about a quote that uh, Minister John McCallum, the Federal Minister of Immigration, made um, to the Chamber of Commerce this spring. The, I, the way he phrased it was, you would have to be an idiot not to know that Nova Scotia wants more immigrants, because everybody's been conveying that message clearly. So. It's really important to understand how much immigration is a shared responsibility between the federal and provincial governments. So it, the Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, um, they very much control who comes to Canada, including to Nova Scotia. So they have to approve not only someone um, as a, uh, an immigrant to Canada, but also if we're designing things within this province to encourage immigration, um, they have to approve that as well. So you'll see that as we go forward and we talk about things, that, that, that differing role. We do have a good working relationship with our federal counterparts, um, but we do want to maximize opportunities. So we, we are continually uh, trying to encourage um, the federal folks to look at what we can do here in this province and the Atlantic region as well. So we have gained considerable ground in the last three years, not only increasing numbers, more newcomers, um, but also strengthening the provincial nominee program and the immigration pathways we'll talk about, um, but championship of diversity in this province and welcoming communities. We were the first province in Canada to start um, and take advantage of uh, the Federal Express Entry Program, which started in 2015. The idea being, how do you more quickly bring people to Canada? So we also, here in Nova Scotia, designed two streams that help suit the labour market needs in the province. And we can talk more about them. They're Express Entry Programs. And also two business immigration streams. They started on January 1st of this year. One is for international entrepreneurs and one is for international graduates that want to start a business. So that business stream for international graduates is actually the first in Canada. We need to keep a lot of bright, talented people here, whatever their ages, but we know we have an opportunity with our students coming through our universities and colleges. So. The other aspect that certainly I think everyone's well aware of is what we've seen in Canada and particularly in Nova Scotia this year is with the Syrian refugee crisis. So um, since December, there's been over a thousand Syrian refugees that have come to the province through a combination of either government sponsorship, private sponsorship, or some combination of that. Communities have really responded well to that. We've also received a modest increase in the last three years um, to budget allocations, and it's important that that money gets spent wisely, which I know is some of the questions that you'll have. We've particularly invested more in immigrant settlement services in the province. Um, as anyone knows, if you move around, and speaking as an Air Force child, moved lots, um, getting settled in a new place, is, uh, there's a lot of supports that can help with that and how you get integrated into a community. So, one of the parts that we've been doing is very much increasing the share that goes to the immigrant settlement service organizations over the last three years. This year, this budget year, it's a total of uh, $6 million. Um, in 2013, it was $5.4 million as a comparison, and we can talk in more details about those numbers. Um, those settlement partners, there's a number of organizations across uh, the province. Um, but particularly two of the largest players um, that we'll be talking about, Immigrant Services Association of Nova Scotia, or ISANS, many people will know, uh, and the YMCA across the province. They've uh, really made a huge difference in not only over time with immigrants, but particularly with the uh, uh, compressed time frame for the numbers of Syrian refugees. So. It's important to recognize that it's not just, even though immigrants tend to go to urban areas, roughly three quarters tend to go there, and that's across Canada, and including Nova Scotia. But it's important what supports are in place outside of a major urban area. Um, so there have been additional investments outside uh, Metro Halifax in the last three years, including a lot of one-on-one -on -one counseling services. A uh, new partnership with the YMCA particularly helped with that. They provide w that one-on-one -on -one contact. They have uh, settlement counselors. Um, and they right now are active um, and have offices and counselors in nine of our communities, Bridgewater, Yarmouth, Cornwallis, Amherst, Truro, Pictou, Sydney, Kenful, and Port Hawkesbury. 
and two of those, the Kenfo and Port Hawkesbury, were just added this spring. We also uh, did an agreement with the New Dawn Center for Social Innovation in Sydney, so they have two uh, people who are full-time settlement counselors. Um, and there's also been other investments we can talk about that have uh, played out in Bridgewater and other areas. So, so it's safe to say that we're growing uh, in the province, the number of immigrants. Uh, they're up already. Um, we get information at different intervals um, and that we recently received the numbers for January to June of 2016. Um, and so not only did we fill all the nominations under the federal allocation that received the cap, um, which is 1,350, which we're also working on this year, those are the principal applicants. But remember, they also bring family members. So last year in total in Nova Scotia, there were 3,403 3, people that came to Nova Scotia. Um, in the first six months, we're already over that. We've suppressed that. So we're doing well as a province. So, um, and remember, that's not just refugees. That, are people, that also includes people coming in through the nominee program, which we can talk about. So, so that means more nominations, more landings, more demand on the system and those settlement services and how do we help them um, as well. So uh, we tried to provide quite a bit of information besides the briefing package that was researched for you in the tables and charts that we provided to you to show you which organizations are active, where the money is going. So in the months and weeks ahead, we definitely want to be continue that focus on immigration build those strong relationships. Everybody has a role to play. Um, certainly MLAs across the province, because you're very connected to your communities, have a role in that, um, in finding out what's happening, what more can be done, what can we do to be a welcoming province and help people come here, but also stay here. That's really important. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Towers. We'll move to uh, Mr. Houston for 20 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for those uh, introductory comments on this very interesting, uh, very interesting file. Now, in terms of the nominees, so we're just trying to understand. So we have 1,350 annual uh, allotment, I guess, of nominees that we can have. And they, they come off a nominee list that the province puts forward to the federal government. So how many, how many, how many persons would be on the, the list today? that the province has put forward to the federal government asking for, for nominee approval. Ms. Towers? Okay. So it's, it's an ongoing system. Um, so it's done on all throughout the year. So we issue nomination certificates to people that they can then use and start the process. So think of it as a constantly, I think of it as a constantly moving train. So you're issuing certificates and when people actually arrive might not be in the year they receive the certificate, might be the next year. So there's, th that's going on. So I'll turn to Suzanne to add some more information about the details of how that process works. Well, I guess, sure, yes. But I guess then the question would be how many certificates has the province issued? To date, yeah. for this year, yeah. oh, okay. We have about 500 spaces left. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. I think so. The province issues a certificate, which says to a person, "We are going to nominate you." Mm -hmm. But by virtue of the province nominating that person, are they going to get approval? That certainly, we've done a lot of the uh, original processing checking on that, um, but it still goes through the federal immigration folks to be reviewed and they have to get final approval for someone to be a permanent resident in Canada. Um, one of the things we're working on, um, all the provinces and territories with the federal government, is how to streamline that as much as possible so it's not assessed at a provincial level for a nomination and then all over again um, at the express entry that's very much what it's designed to do to try to streamline that but it's continual improvement on that okay okay so um, so I guess the theory is if you if you're allowed 1350 per year you issue 1350 certificates is that fair that's correct, okay. and we can help you with some of the numbers as well, because each year it may be that we fill our cap, um, but some of our other neighbors don't, and we can request to use their unallocated certificates. So in some year, Nova Scotia has been able to 
bring in even more than our cap. It may not be large, it may be an additional 20, 30, but that's the other thing as we get towards year end, um, there is that negotiation back and forth. Okay, so if, you, if the province is, is uh, able to issue 1,350 certificates, how many people apply for those certificates? Like, uh, just, uh, let's say 2015, how many, how many applications did you have for certificates that you had to pick 1,350 from? Okay. Do you know the number off the top of your head? Explain. I'd have to check, but I'll have to check. I don't know off the top of my head the exact number of how Just many. Just order of applied. magnitude. Easily three times that. Okay. Um, okay. But remember, there may be people that apply and they do it as a, almost a blanket application. They want to come to Canada, but they may ask in Alberta and BC and Nova Scotia. So it's, it's not just who applies to come to Nova Scotia. They may apply for anywhere in Canada and hope one of the provinces takes them in. Okay. Okay. So how do you, so you wouldn't issue a certificate to somebody who's applied in multiple provinces, would you? Ms. Lay? Yep, Thanks. So one of the things that we look th uh, at in our program is intention to settle in Nova Scotia. And so we look at a, vi a variety of factors. And one of those, as you mentioned, is whether they've applied to other provinces in the country. And certainly if they have, um, if there's a pattern of, you know, five applications in Alberta, that would play into our decision of whether they truly intend to come and settle in Nova Scotia. <coughs> okay. Okay. No, that's helpful. So of the, of the certificates for of the, I guess we're talking 2016 now, the certificates that have been issued, have you issued all 1,350 for 2016? No, not Ms. yet. Ms. Uh, Towers? <laughs> not yet. Um, that's a, it, we, we check constantly. Um, we have a target um, we work towards each month that the nominee officers work on. Um, and so we're, there's two, pieces to it, what we call base nominations and express entry nominations that total 1,350. And that was when I said we have about 500 spaces left in this calendar year because immigration is done on a calendar year, not a fiscal year, um, for checking those numbers. So, so we're, we're well on our way, okay. so about 65%. And for those 500 certificates that are still available, you have thousands of applicants. Yes, and okay. so we're probably issuing uh, anywhere in, uh, I would say right now, about 170 certificates per month. Okay, and of the, of the certificates that have been, once they're issued, then that person then has to apply for permanent residency or citizenship? Or? It depends partially on the stream that they come in under. If they're connected, for example, through a skilled worker stream where there's a job offer, one of the advantages in the Nova Scotia Provincial Nominee Program is that people can come in and work, um, whereas under the federal system, they have to have everything approved before they can start. So that enables them to come here, fill the labor market need, and then complete all the work that the federal government requires for the permanent residency. Okay, so of the, of the if there's 1350 a year, there's 500 left, there's roughly 800 that have been issued, and are most of those people here working? The, it would vary. As I said, once the certificate goes out and they're nominated, um, when they physically can get here is affected by a lot of things. It may be family commitments. It may be when the job starts. It may be a security check they still have to complete with the federal system. So there's always going to be a bit of that time lag, um, but certainly some of the folks would have started arriving. Okay. Okay. So um, just to, so for last year, the th uh, 3,405 people I think I saw immigrated to Nova Scotia, so 1,350 of those would have been under the nominee program. The uh, rest, sir, some sorry. would have been under this like family sponsor program and some would have been under refugee program. Do you kind of know how that breaks down? Correct. So there, uh, um, I'll uh, pull it out here. I know I do have it in, in all this paperwork uh, about the breakdown of that. Um, so there certainly would be, I believe it's 1,079. We can check the exact number for you that would have been Syrian refugees. Um, and then uh, the next largest majority of that would have been people coming through one of the economic streams to jobs. And then a much smaller proportion coming in as um, protected persons under another category or family dependents. Um, Suzanne, do you have the numbers handy right here? Ms. Lay? Sorry. 
the oh, slide. That's okay, thanks. So um, for 2015, our total landings um, were just over 3,400. And of those, um, uh, 1,394 in 2015 were provincial nominee landings. Um, 1,090 were federal economic landings, so federal economic streams. And then 917 were federal non-economic, so family class, refugees, that kind of thing. And so there's a difference. Um, there's a bit of a nuance in here where, uh, you know, there's 1,394 landings, um, which basically translates, translates to the nominees we've nominated in the past and their family members that are coming with them. So there's a bit of an order of magnitude where, um, you know, a multiplier where a, a person, a principal applicant who's counted under the 1350 brings with them potentially a spouse or children. So the, the landings number is usually higher. Okay. Okay. Um. Just in terms of the uh, in terms of the process to become a permanent resident, so do you have a, like a number? What's the average length of time it takes for somebody to become a permanent resident in Nova Scotia? And does that different is that different across provinces? Would different provinces have different? Uh, Ms. Towers. So it would vary across provinces. Right now, the average time in Nova Scotia to process someone under the provincial nominee uh, program is a month. We're fairly quick at going through that. The amount of time then until they can arrive, as we talked about, might be affected by other things. Under the federal system, under their express entry system, their target is um, within six months, and they're meeting about 85% of the cases within six months under the federal system, whereas Nova Scotia, we're at a month. Okay. Okay. Now, okay, let's, let's so in terms of the... Um the settlement funding, so the province, the budget's about $6 million this year. Now, am I correct to, to like, that's in addition to federal settlement monies? Is that, is there two pots of money that come to help with the settlement process, or is it only provincial? Uh, you're correct, there are two pots of money. Uh, the provincial is the just shy of $6 million, um, that's coming out of province of Nova Scotia. The federal amount is around $8 million. So combined, it's those two, the six and the eight. So it's 14 million combined. Now the federal, the eight million is probably a, just a formula, is it? It just comes off how many, how many immigrants arrive in Nova Scotia, I guess, or? Yes, it is very much based on numbers. And remember, there's also funds for different aspects around settlement. Um, it could be pre-arrival, it could be language services, it could be workforce related. Um, so it, it can be coming out of different funding sources as well. The federal? The federal um, and also even our provincial. That six million is a reflection of uh, about four, 4.3 million that comes from uh, settlement services which the Office of Immigration are directly assigning through our budget um, and also through the job fund agreement there's a million and a half um, that is coming through federal monies originally to labor and advanced education for various work related um, employment development which is then directed to the immigration budget so they again the provincial one is the 4.3 direct settlement services and a, and a cluster of services there, and the million and a half that is very much related to job counseling, resume writing, all those types of services. And then the federal 8 million would be, again, those range of types of services. But we work closely. It's important to know that um, they're not duplicated. It, we go out of our way to make sure that we're working with our partners um, so that it's, it's directed where it most is needed um, uh, for those settlement supports. And it's not the federal government and the provincial government funding the exact same thing. Okay. Um, so the, the, the federal and the provincial, and is it, is it, how does Nova Scotia compare it to other provinces? Like, does every province get a federal allotment and then top it up with money from the provincial treasury? Or do the, the different provinces do it different? I can certainly uh, know that the federal government would be providing money to provinces and territories for immigration, but I could not speak to what provincial and territorial budgets would be for their own immigration. But, but is, it your, is it your understanding that every province adds some, 
add some additional monies to the process, or is there any provinces that think this is a federal responsibility, so it's federal, federal money? I can certainly check on that for you um, and get some information back to you. Okay, mm -hmm. it would be it would be just be interesting to see what's the if there's any philosophical differences at the provincial level on who's supposed to who's who's responsible for funding the settlement. Um, I guess that because I'd be more curious if that in, then impacts if they're able to get more federal money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's so I would be I would be interested in that. Um, now, in terms of the in terms of the let's talk about the 14 million which would be the six from the province and eight from the feds. The department, your department disperses that 14 million? Does the, the federal government send the, their aid out in chunks to the YMCA or to whoever, or do they give it to your department to disperse? So I can speak to what the Office of Immigration does, um, and then Suzanne may be able to add to it because she's worked both on the federal system and the provincial system. Um, so what we do is uh, detailed service agreements with the different organizations. And so within the information that was provided to you in the charts and tables, you can see which organizations, for example, in this year in 2016, 17 fiscal, um, there's 14 organizations across Nova Scotia that are receiving funding. And so we work through basically a service agreement. What are you going to provide? Um, here's the uh, approved levels for salaries, et cetera, the types of services. Um, and then as well, if there's any slippage, like one organization is not going to use all its money in the course of the year, um, we can then look at if that can be shifted to one of the other organizations that may have additional needs. They may, they, their proposals may say, we're expecting to service 30 clients or 50 clients, and they may have more or less. And so we can reallocate as needed to, to shift that gap. Um, I'll turn it over to Suzanne to uh, touch on the federal aspects of how that money is distributed. Ms. Lay. Great, thanks. So the federal uh, settlement funding is, as you mentioned earlier, distributed based on a formula across the country. Um, each province, and it's a fairly complicated formula, uh, but it's basically the number of landings, so the number of people that have come to the province um, with, a, with a multiplier in there in terms of the increased support that the federal government sees that refugees require. So there's a small multiplier in there, and it's basically, you know, a, an algorithm of um, landings over how much money is available, and it's a three-year average of landings. So, um, so to your question earlier about whether other provinces are are able to get incremental money in different ways, uh, everybody's distributed based on the formula, um, and there are no devolved agreements. The federal government does their own call for proposals process every year. So, as Deputy Towers mentioned, uh, we meet with the regional staff here who are responsible for distributing settlement funding, and we'll have a case conference and make sure that. If there are needs coming up or there are, are gaps uh, in funding that the federal government's not providing, is there a way that we can come behind it and provide that support? Okay. So in terms of the formula from the federal government, you mentioned a multiplier in there for, for certain situations, I guess. That uh, it seems like there's probably a bit of subjectivity in that, would there be? Like, uh, does the province then say, well, we need, to, uh, we need this multiplier because because of our set of circumstances or who is there any subjectivity around that multiplier no the multiplier is only on refugee landings uh, and it's basically so the number of landings every province has and then a small multiplier for refugees and only refugees and it's a national formula of, applied across the country is there any is there any multiplier for whether the um, where people are going to go to urban centers versus rural centers or is it the same? Not formula? in the national model okay. that I've seen. Okay. So in terms of in terms of the um, so in, in the, so the province has six million dollars that gets distributed out through I think fourteen organizations, and so some of those I just want to make sure I understand some of those fourteen organizations would be getting they'd be getting provincial money and they'd also be having a separate application to the federal government and they might be getting some federal funding as well. Is that would that be the case? Uh, Ms. Towers. 
Yes, it would vary with the organization. A large organization like ISANS, the Immigrant Settlement Association, they definitely are receiving both. Um, some of the others may be very small scale, very localized, very <coughs> regional. It may be just provincial money or it may be just federal money. Okay. So. In terms of the 14 organizations that the province has service agreements, so those 14 organizations get the $6 million? Is that, that's kind of a, in, in rough terms, that's how it works. So, um, so are they all not for profits or is there any profit organizations in that, in that 14? Maybe you have the list of 14. Yes, and we'll, we'll pull that out. We'll find the page number to reference in your briefing material so that you can see those. Um, but yes, it, the eligibility even to apply for that money. So what happens is the province issues an invitation to apply, basically a call for proposals in the fall of each year. And um, so any of those nonprofits can apply. They have to have a background in immigration settlement. Um, but it, it also gives the categories of types of services, but it's still pretty open-ended. You know, they can be very creative within that. Um, and then that's assessed and um, they're confirmed subject to budget appropriation um, in, by February so that they can start work first April. Um, so that's very much how that works. Um, Suzanne, do you have the table number handy for folks to look at? Ms. Lane? Thanks. So it's in the uh, submission that we provide in it's table 2A. I. Um, and so you'll see that most of those are not-for-profit organizations. Our settlement guidelines don't disclude um, language schools, private corporations, if there are, um, if there's an, an identified need. And so um, the only one I think that may be an exception to the question about not-for-profit is new voice languages and tutoring in Lunenburg. I believe that they have a business line uh, where they teach um, language to international students, where they make a profit, um, but they, I think, may be the only one. Okay, so in, in the, the 14 that, that sign service agreements, that would be, how many, how many organizations would have applied? Do you have any sense of, was it just 14 that applied? And so for last year, I'm just looking for my other note. Last year, um, there were a few uh, organizations we didn't fund. Um, one was a research pr proposal, for instance, that we're moving over to other, we're working with them in a different way. Uh, so we don't fund everybody that applies. We also get sometimes uh, applications where there's a duplication of service. So somebody's proposing to teach language in a community where we know there's already uh, language instruction happening there. And so we, we do look for partnerships uh, in applications, and if we do see duplication, uh, we'll ask, we'll not approve the application and we'll work with folks over the course of the year if they're interested in coming back the next year. Okay. So thank you, Mr. Houston. You've, uh, you've got a good eye on the clock because you have just run out of time. Move to the uh, NDP caucus and Ms. Zan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you so much for coming in. I'm, I'm very interested in, in this topic uh, as an immigrant myself coming from Australia back in 1968, <laughs> came over with my family in a year when um, there was a shortage of teachers in Canada, and we sailed over on an ocean liner called the SS Canberra with 2,000 Australian teachers uh, because there was a shortage here and too many in Australia. And uh, at the beginning, we were only going to stay for a year or two. Um, we moved to Regina. Saskatchewan when we first came and then we moved to Nova Scotia and stayed because we did find a welcoming community in Truro and uh, and my mom and dad actually started the multicultural association there and started to welcome other you know, immigrants and bring everybody together which I think is so important in, in keeping our immigrants here and making them feel like they they have a home and there are other people in the same boat so to speak. Um, so I know how important immigration is to the growth of our province, especially with a, an aging, a rapidly aging province. And I know that, that we rely on the federal government to allow us a certain number of immigrants. Also while uh, the NDP was in government, I know that we, we did uh, set a goal of doubling 
uh, immigration by 2020 and with that welcome home to Nova Scotia immigration plan, which I'm happy to see that this goal has been continued and carried forward by the current government. So to meet with that goal, uh, it's said in that, that uh, program that the province would need to issue 1,500 nomination certificates a year by 2020. Um, which would obviously require the federal government to eliminate the cap on nomination certificates. So uh, has there been any progress in that? I noticed that, for instance, um, the immigration minister, John McCollum, in Ottawa, uh, told Nova Scotians that the cap would be looked at again sometime in the next three years, but he didn't really offer details. So. Um, could you maybe provide an update on, on this situation? Ms. Towers. Thank you. Okay, and I'll ask Suzanne to pull out from the briefing materials the nominations over the past decade and how that's changed, but I'll speak to it generally. So uh, Nova Scotia has definitely been jumping in leaps um, after a very slow start of, you know, 300 a year, 500 a year, um, and it was 700 for, for a number of years. It's really only in the last three years that we've seen that openness to increasing that allocation cap. Um, so it went up um, to 1,050, and the province was, everyone was helping to lobby to increase it, that this province was ready to take more people in. And that's why it went up to 1,350 last year, which was maintained for this year, which we did not even know for sure that whether that would happen or it would drop back. But it's been maintained. We're certainly on track to fill that. The more credibility as a province we have by meeting that cap all the time and, it, and trying to exceed it, it increases our probability of getting the federal government to recognize that we can take in more. There's a couple important points there. One is we need to make sure that the communities are welcoming, as you mentioned, but also that there is education and employment. Um, jobs are very much a part of that. We need to employ everyone that's here. As you know in my other portfolio, that's important as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that going forward, that's very much part of ongoing discussions. Um, just even in the last week, um, certainly a through conversations with uh, federal, provincial, and territorial colleagues. That's what happens. Each year, um, there's a discussion, and uh, provinces and territories lobby the federal government for their numbers. And the federal government introduces in the 1st of November each year to their cabinet um, what the proposed total number for Canada will be, and within each of those categories, the economic, the family, et cetera. Um, and the other part that we've, besides just total numbers, that everyone has been um, trying to work towards and negotiating is whether we can move to multi-year planning. Because mm -hmm. that would be very efficient for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, certainly the governments, but also the settlement providers, the, all the organizations that are involved. Um, so that's an ongoing discussion right now. So we'll be looking to see what comes out of this fall's allocation. Um, the other aspect that you may have heard about, um, which Minister McCallum did announce with the Atlantic premiers back in July, was around a pilot specifically for the Atlantic region. And the idea was to make it um, within the economic stream, how can you make even more matches between businesses that need labor um, finding immigrants that can come to meet that demand. And so what we're working on right now with the, the Atlantic region and the federal colleagues is what, are the, what is that program going to look like? What are the criteria? How do we identify what the needs are? What are the occupations that we know we need, the types of workers? Um, so we're working on that, but that has a potential of an additional up to 2,000 people over the Atlantic region, of which Nova Scotia would be another 800, for example, if it's a proportional allocation. Um, and based on the record, Nova Scotia has been very successful, even more so than our neighbors sometimes. So we may be able not only take our allocation, but the unfilled parts in those other regions. So I think there's a real opportunity, and that's a pilot over the next three years, to not only build on our existing cap, but potentially add to it. Um. Thank you very much for that. And is there a name for that program? It falls under the Atlantic Growth Strategy. And so if you looked under July of this year, um, there were particular aspects under that growth strategy, such as clean tech, 
um, was one of them innovation, but immigration is one of the five aspects under that growth strategy. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's interesting because um, you know you bring up a number of different issues there, which I'm interested in. Education for one, and housing is another. I know that that's very important, um, but also. Uh, I know as an MLA that we oftentimes get immigrants who've been here for a while who are frustrated because they are professionals in their own countries and are not allowed to practice here. So for instance, doctors and engineers. Um, I, I have one doctor in particular I can think of who's a brain surgeon, neurosurgeon, and she, she's so frustrated because there's only, they only allow a certain number of people to be accepted each year and to be approved to be able to actually do the work that they did back in back home in her case in Russia. Um, is there any update on those changes to try and make it easier for professionals once they do get here? So I, I can speak to it broadly, mm -hmm. um, and I'll ask Suzanne to add to it. Um, it's uh, known as the foreign uh, credential recognition. Mm -hmm. um, and that, as you say, it, it crosses quite a number of disciplines, and there is a law to work on that, just as there has been on labor mobility. How can you move across provinces? How can you move across countries and have those credentials recognized? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's there's more than one part to that. One is not only are they recognized the institutions they may have come from, for example, um, the practical experience somebody may have, um, but also sometimes it's a, there's cultural aspects to it as well. And one of the interesting examples that was provided to me by some of the folks at ISANS was around pharmacists, how there were people from other countries that came and they knew their science, they could figure out dosages, no problem but they had not culturally been exposed to what would be typical in Nova Scotia and Canada in terms of how you interact with people. And so they were not passing, it was a cultural competency, they were not passing their tests because of that. So they, and they, they figured that out, they're taking um, groups, whether it's pharmacists or some of the other fields, and saying what are the existing barriers, what is it that's affecting somebody's credentials being recognized, and then figuring out how to um, help people move through that system. And as well, there's a lot of work going on in Canada. There's a working group across all the provinces and territories and with our federal colleagues on foreign uh, credential recognition. So maybe I'll just pause there and then turn it over to Suzanne to add to that. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Lay. Great, thanks. So uh, just to add a couple of things, if I may, uh, one of the points I wanted to make was that in the nominee program, and I know you're talking about people that are here already, but uh, one of the things that we look for in particular we ask candidates, applicants, that if they're coming in a, in a licensed occupation, that they do their homework before they come, that they understand whether they can, they can practice in their profession, because the last thing we want is that for them to be frustrated. Um, we also provide supports at pre-arrival, so uh, working with ISANS and with others, uh, with the, uh, an organization called SIP, we do some uh, information sharing for folks before they come. So what's it like to be in Nova Scotia? What is, if you don't have a job when you're coming, what is it what does it mean to do a resume here? What does it mean to work with uh, the licensing body in your, in your uh, field of practice, for instance? Um, but we also work with our settlement service providers for the folks that are here already and potentially are frustrated. So we have some occupation-specific bridging programs, for instance. Um, uh, we have a program run out of NSCC for internationally educated nurses. Um, you know, there's some job workshops, um, some communication-specific programs. So as Deputy Towers mentioned, making sure that folks are able to work in their in the new culture that they're living in using the skills that they're bringing from home um, which is part of the part of the work that's happening nationally I think, in terms of best practices thank you um, I believe in this particular case uh, the, the woman came over with her husband who had a job at the at Dal AC but she's a doctor and there they do the, they only allow like one or two or three each year to, to to be accepted, something like that. So, which is, it's just very frustrating. They've, they've been here for quite a while now, and she still isn't able to practice. But um, that is something that I noticed when I was in British Columbia too. Uh, when I lived there, there were a lot of taxi drivers who were, you know, from other countries who were engineers and doctors, and they were driving taxis, which is hard. So, it is nice when you can tie the need for jobs in, as when, when we moved over here, there was an obvious need for teachers and we filled that and obviously stayed. Um, I was going to say, 
I had heard that the, um, that the increase in the provincial uh, immigrants hasn't necessarily been kept up with the funding, uh, and in particular for the provincial nominee program. So I noticed you said that you went from it went from 5.4 million in 2013 to 6 million now. Um, but so in the last year, for instance, since we've had the the new the new um, immigrants and the refugees, what has been the increase in funding in the last year? Ms. Towers? I wish I could pull up my numbers. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's uh, a couple of areas in which there were funding increases. Sorry? So it's okay. <laughs> there were a couple of areas in which there were funding increases. So one is specific to settlement services, the one that we're talking about that's now just shy of the six million. Um, so it's been, uh, the settlement funding was in the 2013 was 2.9 million and then it was 3.38 million in 2014-15. Mm -hmm. It went to 3.58 million in 25-16 and this year to the 4 million. Okay. We can get you the very exact numbers you want, but you can see the scale that is going up by a few hundred thousand each year as the number of immigrants have come up as well. Um, so there's some of it is um, uh, going into those uh, settlement organizations because remember it's proposal based. They're coming forward, they know their clients, they're saying we, we it's not directly proportional. They may be able to provide a program and having a few more people doesn't make a significant difference to what it's gonna cost them, but it may be incremental but not directly proportional. So there's a bit right. of that as mm -hmm. well going on. Mm -hmm. So, so it sounds like um, we heard from from IANS that uh, it's just that the increased numbers of people has not been met with the increased provincial funding that they actually need. So that that is concerning, and in particular for me, um, affordable housing does come to mind. For instance, um, according to Halifax's most recent housing needs assessment recent immigrants pay over 40% of their income on housing in this city. And that's really just a fraction less than single individual households. So that's concerning given that a large number, uh, a large proportion of the new immigrant households really are considered low income. And um, I know that a lot of them have children who have to go to schools, um, and that means that there are, you know, five new immigrant families actually fall within the very first income bracket. So those particular family members are working for minimum wage, and we know that that's already pretty difficult to work on. Many people have to have two jobs, three jobs in order to just survive. So what is the Office of Immigration doing to ensure that affordable housing is available for these newest Nova Scotians? So a couple of things, uh, I'll see if we can get all the pieces pulled together for you. Thank you. So there's aspects, remember, see if I get these in order. So immigrants as a whole, as you know, there's a wide range from very highly skilled, they may be coming in, into a very high end job. Um, the, and then the, uh, at one end of the spectrum may be folks such as the recent refugees coming from Syria. So there's a, there's a huge range in terms of what um, they bring with them and what they will need for supports as well. So part of what both the Provincial Office of Immigration does as well as the federal uh, uh, supports are related to what those needs are, okay? So one of the things uh, I'll remember to, to turn to Suzanne uh, in a second, um, we can give you the numbers, for example, that are provided in direct supports for things such as housing um, that are directed at refugees, okay? Um, so there's not only the funding that we provide that we've been talking about quite a bit around the settlement services, which are very much directed at those initial months and year coming in. Um, how do you help people get settled in the first place? Um, but versus ongoing 
because that's very much tied to mm -hmm. the labor market and getting employment for folks because out of that comes the household income that helps them cover all their costs as it would for anybody else. Um, so I think it's important that we, we think about who on the spectrum, as you said, it may be a lower income bracket that we're particularly trying to find out what the scale of the issue is. Um, um, because I'm sure, as you know, uh, in the housing aspects, and um, I wouldn't purport to know all about housing. I deal with aspects of it through both immigration and Aboriginal affairs. Um, but that's very much, you know, Housing Nova Scotia is working with the other departments. So what is the demand level? Um, what is the supply? Um, how can that be covered off to, to match? Um, and so that's something that I think we can come back maybe with some more information to you. Mm -hmm. um, but at this moment, maybe what I'll do, Chair, is turn it to uh, Suzanne to speak to what we know are direct supports that are available when someone first arrives. Thank you. Great, thanks. So we'll talk about the Syrian refugees in particular because I think though that's the, um, that's the, uh, the unprecedented national project, I think, is, is that's the piece that we have been paying a lot of attention to this year, particularly in terms of housing. Um, so it was, a, it was a lot of people in a short amount of time. Um, and uh, kudos to our settlement service providers, ISANS, who is the resettlement assistance provider, uh, who's responsible for finding temporary housing, finding permanent housing. They were the first, we were the first province in the country to have people out of temporary housing and into permanent housing in the in the refugee effort. So uh, big applause to them for that work. It was it was a lot of work. Um, but two points on in terms of funding for housing and funding for refugees in particular, I just wanted to make um, that the federal government this year, so deputy mentioned that there's six million uh, going from the federal government into settlement this year and 1.5 million of that is incremental for refugees. So it's, it's the, uh, uh, 6.5 million was our, our allocation under the national formula, mm -hmm. and 1.5 of that is is to make sure that those folks have the support that they need. Mm -hmm. um, and I do have some information uh, about the types of, of support, uh, direct support for housing that refugees in particular get when they come to uh, Nova Scotia, government-assisted refugees. Um, so they'll get, um, it depends on the size of the family, uh, but you know, if you're a single person, you'll get $300 a month for housing. Um, if you're three or more, $620 a month. So it's aligned with provincial um, uh, income assistance rates. Um, Though also one of the things that government assisted refugees are provided by the federal government is a sort of small startup allowance. So they, uh, a bit of money to buy some furniture. Again, it depends on the size of the family. Uh, and it goes from one person, which is just over $1,300, um, up to, you know, five people would be $3,500. Thank you. And, and uh, how long do you support uh, a new family for both? Is it different for immigrants than for refugees? Or is it the same? Order. I, I do apologize. Oh. We just ran out of time. We'll move to the Liberal Caucus and Mr. Rankin. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and I do like this topic as well. I think that it's important to recognize some of the contribution beyond government in this instance. So I don't think it's con commensurate with the, the millions that it's spent in a budget line item to the support required for each individual family I, I actually would venture to say that the that we actually bring in more revenue into the province uh, with the more immigration that we have and certainly with a strategy with multi-tiered ways of um, getting into the country um, but even with the refugees alone we had the private sector to, um, giving apartments for rental the rona building was available for donations and uh, for those who watched CBC last night, there was a great example with a, a family in Mabu actually donating a house when we're talking about housing. And uh, within one day, the, the community got together and filled that house with, uh, with furniture for that family. And of course, we had the federal government providing for health care within the first year for, for all these refugee families coming in. So I think that's important to note. Um, with the entrepreneurial stream that was introduced, I just have a few questions on how that relates to uh, helping grow the economy. And I was wondering, given in the past that there was, uh, I think they called it a mentorship uh, program under a former government that uh, wasn't working the way that uh, it should have been working to retain immigrants here. What, uh, what was learned from that? 
that process and were there best practices that were looked upon in other jurisdictions? As I know, like Manitoba had a good strategy with it and that's how they were able to develop a cap that was like 5,000 and, and that really drove economic growth. So yeah, I'm just, if you could explain how the mechanics of that program works and um, how is it doing so far? Are we getting applications uh, from across the world? Ms. Towers. So there's been quite a bit of change over the last decade. Um, that uh, economic stream, which includes the entrepreneur stream. So some of those changes, uh, my understanding is that uh, people at the Office of Immigration before my time did that look at best practices from around the world, from different countries, from different provinces. And um, some of the aspects that they particularly have changed over this past decade, um, there is no transfer of money through the province, um, which is what used to be the case. But all staff are trained um, so that they know the types of potential fraud aspects they could be looking for, the security aspects they need to be mindful of. Um, there's very much a use of third parties now to look at um, someone's financial background, their net worth, um, to make sure that it's clear it's not a government officer, it's a third party. Uh, specialists looking at those things. So those, those safeguards have been built into the system very much to improve the probability of an entrepreneur coming here, um, very much being ready um, to not only potentially start a business or invest in a business um, and be very active in the Nova Scotia economy. So we, we've seen that shift. Um, since the entrepreneur stream was introduced um, in this past year, there's been over 150 uh, um, yeah, people who have applied um, and over 50 that we've screened down to invitations to apply. They meet basic criteria based on those assessments. Um, and there's four that are currently being assessed right now at the office for potential uh, certificates. Um, and the range, I'll ask Suzanne to speak to it, but we're getting those at interest, level of interest from countries, so the ones that we invited to apply in detail, um, it was, I'm not sure off the top of my head, she'll know, but I believe it was over 20 different countries across. So we're seeing a real global interest, and that is one of the advantages in this electronic age, having online applications. We have a much broader reach than we used to have as well. So maybe I'll, uh, Chair, if I may, turn it to Suzanne to add to that. Ms. Lay. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So um, if I can go back to the first point about uh, lessons learned and what we did just to build on Deputy Towers. Um, so we we spent two years, honestly, looking at programs here across the country. So you mentioned Manitoba, British Columbia has uh, a program that's successful. Other provinces like Ontario, PEI and others have either had them or have current streams. We looked at uh, models in the US and New Zealand, uh, the UK and Australia, um, and actually spoke with officials in those countries about what was working uh, and what wasn't working. Uh, we also, of course, looked at our Auditor General's, Auditor, Auditor General's reports and what we'd experienced here in Nova Scotia uh, and what IRCC, the federal government, was telling us in terms of best practices, so things that, um, uh, you know, cut down on fraud, cut down on misrepresentation, because what we're really interested in is making sure that the people that come to Nova Scotia through our stream are people who really want to come and stay here and build their life and build a business and aren't using uh, the economic stream as a way, or the entrepreneur stream as a way to buy their permanent residency card, because we've heard from across the country that that's, that's often the case. Yeah. So Deputy mentioned things like uh, the program has an expression of interest as a first step. So an applicant has to come to us and say, here's who I am, here's what I'm interested in, and I'm interested in coming to Nova Scotia. And so we've seen 159 expressions of interest so far since we launched in January. Uh, and then we'll, we'll take that list of people um, and their attributes and we'll select who we want to apply to the program. And so 53 invitations to apply have gone out. And those, as Deputy Towers mentioned, uh, 23 three countries those come from. Um, India has 15, Iran has eight, and Pakistan has four, and then there's 20 other countries with one or two applications each, so a broad range of global interest. Um, the program is fundamentally different. Uh, as Deputy Towers mentioned, there's third-party verifications of financial statements. Um, the expression of interest lets us control intake, lets us control who actually applies. Um, one of the pieces that's really important for us, as I mentioned, we're interested in people who are willing to come and stay. Uh, and one of the 
tools we have is the temporary to permanent model which we're using, which was a, a piece that we learned from British Columbia. And so what that means essentially is once somebody's approved to come to the province, we'll support them for a work permit to come and start their business for two years and we'll hold back the nomination until they come and get settled and, and show to us that they're, they're in it for the long term. Do you have any sense of when the first few businesses will be up and running in terms of uh, what, like next calendar year or uh, when I guess the application for some of these uh, 20 applications or 53 invitations would be ultimately approved? Sure. So after, uh, I don't have a, an exact date, um, but we know, so the invitations to apply, for instance, they have 60 days uh, to get back to us, I believe, uh, with a full application. And so in the interim, they have to go and get some of the third party checks. We want them to verify their net worth, for instance, that it was legally obtained. Um, so the four applications that are out, I'm not sure, uh, or that are being assessed, um, we will have a decision on those, I think, in the next couple of months. Uh, and certainly if they're approved, they could come and start their business next year, but sometimes there's a lag in terms of the time it takes somebody to, um, you know, to okay. get rid of their assets in their home country and, and actually make the move and come to Nova Scotia. And one last question on that stream. Is there any, um, strategy to try to focus on any of the rural economies that are like outside of Halifax basically to help economic growth and is there an incentive or some way that we can place some of these businesses in some of the, the older areas? Sure. So one of the things that we've done in the expression of interest phase, um, I'd mentioned people tell us who they are, what their ideas are. Uh, what I hadn't mentioned is each of those attributes uh, is assigned points. Uh, and that's how we select who we invite to apply. It's the person with the highest points. And one of the ways you can get points in that process is if you're uh, proposing to start your business or buy a business outside of Halifax. Okay, okay great, thank you. Ms. Lonis Croft. Thank you. Um, Every time I hear Suzanne, I sort of jump, <laughs> thinking I'm to, to address something. Um, Ms. Towers, you, you mentioned in your opening remarks that uh, immigration was a shared responsibility between the federal and provincial governments. And that's where I get confused, because as an MLA, um, my office is often contacted by, especially with the, with the uh, refugee program here, um, with questions, um, you know, people coming for resources and information. So can you like, better help me understand <coughs> where you go separately and where you intersect your, you know, or overlap in, in uh, your mandates? Ms. Towers. It's really important if you have any inquiries as MLAs um, and somebody's interested or un trying to understand the system, mm -hmm. that's what our office is there to do. Um, so not only everyone that works there, but in particular, there's a dozen nominee officers and their manager and director that are there that know the system inside and out. So they can help people say if they're, for example, maybe they have someone, they have a family member, they're potentially looking to help um, immigrate. Um, they can say, okay, here's all the different pathways, and we'll speak to that in a second, um, that exist. And then what is the best match for you and what you're looking for? Um, is it general information on immigration? Is it specifically someone who wants to immigrate? And that's very much our role is to, to make those connections um, so that we understand both systems as best we can um, to help people. So one of the things that would have been in your package is um, around immigration pathways. What are the different ways to come to Canada and to Nova Scotia? And so you may be able to see in that, it's even color coded, if uh, people can find that, this is what it looks like. Because it's, it's a very helpful piece sometimes to get a quick overview of the immigration system. Oh. And yes, for those of you that were also handed out the, uh, the annual report that just came out, there's a copy on page 19 as well. You may find it in this more easily than all the rest of your briefing package. Uh, so when you have that up, you'll see 
that it's, it's in essence, it, it, we, it's purposely color coded just to make it easier for people to see. The part that's in green is the provincial role. And so that's the nominee program and the different streams associated with that, the skilled worker, the express entry, the entrepreneur that we're talking about. Um, whereas the other colors in there, particularly the blue, relate to the, uh, the parts that the federal government handle as immigration. So the federal role, because they have the legislation, um, the Immigration, Refugee and Protection Act, that federal piece, they have overall control over how many can come to Canada and who's approved to come to Canada and under which of those categories. Um, so then they allocate out to the provinces numbers and types within those pathways. But the provincial role is very much then to help people within each of those pathways where is their best fit? We may be referring them to a federal contact if they don't fit within a provincial stream directly. So that, that's our role, is to help them within that, but also help them navigate the overall system. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, okay, that helps. Um, I found 211 was very helpful, the information found on that, and, and we did refer a lot of groups to that. Um, sometimes, um, I've, I've heard back from groups when they went up to the Office of Immigration, they didn't find it welcoming. Um, and I think it was just um, the environment at the, when you actually, physically, it didn't look inviting. And I don't know if that has changed or whatnot, but uh, there seemed to be lack of information on the glass plate doors and whatnot. So has that, become, has anyone remarked to you about that or? I, ha I have not heard that directly myself, but it, there may be a couple of things there and I would be curious to know, um, and we could have a further conversation on that with anybody who's hearing anything along those lines because one, was it the federal office they went to I'm or not the provincial sure. office? I'm not sure. But, yeah, um, because, th because that's, I, I can't speak to the federal office. And the other is the Nova Scotia Office of Immigration just moved. It was up, the st up on Brunswick Street, um, at, which is where the federal office is al already located. But it just moved this spring, um, so I only have direct knowledge of the new office, which is up in Spring Garden Place. Mm -hmm. um, and I've certainly been hearing from staff um, how much more open and bright and welcoming it is. There's signs when you come in in multiple languages. There's a dedicated receptionist there to greet people. Um, so I, I'd be very much interested to know if this is something that you're hearing recently or from the past, and if there's specific issues, because we'd certainly want to address that and make it easier for people. It was definitely quite a while ago, I would say, um, even before some of the refugee um, uh, issues were coming up and people were, were going to, to the office, but um, it was just a concern that people have mm -hmm. expressed to me, and it, it may have been the federal office as well, but because as I, why I'm asking here is like sometimes separating the, the federal and, and the provincial is, is quite confusing for people. Yeah. So potentially, Chair, maybe Suzanne can answer since she would have had the history with the past office. Ms. Lane. So um, Deputy Towers made a really good point about uh, before our office moved, we were co-located or, or in the same building anyway with the federal government. Um, and it was, I think, highly confusing for applicants who or immigra immigrants who are here uh, who are looking for services and oftentimes are looking for the federal government. Um, but we have a receptionist who as Deputy Towers mentioned, we'll, we'll welcome you to the office, but often they're not looking for us, they're looking for the federal government, and we, we are directing people different ways, uh, but certainly since we've moved, I think some of that confusion has cleared up, that folks are, are, that are coming to us are meaning to come to us, uh, where we have a, a more of a walk-in approach than, than the federal govern, government might in, the, in their building. Okay, and I... Um just going further on, um, you, you sort of mentioned about retaining people, and you know I've often heard um, that we are a well uh, a friendly province, but not necessarily welcoming. So, you know, when, as we transition to this year, as this year ends for some of these refugees that have come over, how can we as MLAs help our 
refugee groups in our communities um, be welcoming, continue to be welcoming and, ex you know, showing hospitality and understanding to our, to our newcomers. Ms. Towers. Uh, that's a that's a critical point for all Nova Scotians. Um, if, w as we know, many people came to Nova Scotia from somewhere else. You know, it may have been another province, it may have been another country, um, and that's that welcoming um, has to be more than superficial. It's really important. And what's what fairly well known, and I'm certainly learning more all the time, is for someone to want to stay wherever they, it's a specific community or province or country, it's very much tied to not only what um, welcome they receive, um, what are the different things, and we can talk about what are the, some of the things communities and MLAs can do around that. But the, the flip side of that is as well, um, immigrants themselves will say, um, it's very much important that they become part of the community, not just that someone welcomes them and tries to do everything for them, but how can they contribute? It may be through the school system, it may be through their job, it may be as a volunteer. So it's not only what can people already here do, but what can we do to make it easier for people coming to contribute and become part of that community? Um, so I would really encourage MLAs, you're, you're very much more in touch with your community generally, you're out there, you meet people, um, talking to people, the awareness, being open about people coming wherever they may come from. Um, Besides the organizations that are dealing with this all the time, it's the day-to-day, -day, the neighbors, the communities. Um, one of the things that started this year um, was um, there was a dedicated block of $100,000 created to be, to be a, um, a community set, uh, refugee support fund or development fund. Um, and the idea was individual organizations and communities, and I would encourage you, we can, the information is in your briefing, but. We're more than happy to help people look at that. Um, could apply for grants of up to $1,000. It's a very simple seed money, but the idea is that enables people to express how they can welcome someone. And there's a huge range of ways as those applications come in, um, it enables people to contribute and be part of this. They don't have to be a member of ISANS. They can be the neighbor. What can we do? Um, and one of the things we have, and I'll ask Suzanne to pull it up, is uh, examples for you of the types of things we receive today, and they're phenomenal to watch. Everything from a community picnic to one of the high schools going to teach um, uh, now some of the new children how to play ball hockey. <laughs> Um, I mean, those are the kinds of things. How do you become part of, not changing your culture, but understanding the culture and being part of the community. I think that's something every single Nova Scotian, and particularly MLAs who have those contacts, what are those? And, and uh, so when you have a chance to pull those up, if you've got them, I'll turn it over to Suzanne. I think there's some good examples for people there. Ms. Lay, we just have about 20 seconds. Okay, great. So the table's been um, in your package, but it's been updated. So there's 28 uh, grants altogether, uh, two for exceptional volunteers. For, so those are folks who have been going above and beyond volunteering to help people settle in the community. And 26 projects for a range of things, um, like the deputy had said, welcoming events, picnics, uh, community uh, meetings, language training, um, a, a variety of really interesting and neat projects across the province. Thank you very much. We'll move back to Mr. Houston for 14 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just, just on that, what table number is that? Oh, sorry, Ms. Lay. That's an easy one. That's 2BV. Um, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. And we can, it's on page 12 of the package we provided. Okay, that's great. So in terms of the, um, the um, 1350 certificates, the nominee certificates, and you, you get thousands of applications for that. So. Is there a, can you share with us, and you maybe don't have to discuss it all now, but I wonder if you could share with the committee the, 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 the process, the, the criteria that you use, like do you score them, do you score the applicants, or maybe there might, might even be a chart you can just share with us. Is that something you can, you can share with us? Is it, is it? Ms. Towers? So this is very much something I'm learning myself, the details of that uh, review process. So I, I will ask Suzanne to speak to that because I'm going through the orientation myself to learn all those pieces, not only uh, um, here in Nova Scotia, but what's used federally as well. Okay. Sure, but is it, is, it, is, it a written, is there written procedures that you can, maybe we we'll just share those and then if I have detailed questions, I'll circle back. 
afterwards. But okay, yes. thank you. Maybe the clerk may make a note of that too. Maybe. Um, so in the in the certificates that have been issued, let's talk about this year, which I think there was maybe about 800 ish certificates issued this year. Would there be any doctors in those certificates? Like, is there any kind of concerted effort um, by the office to to search out doctors, for example? Ms. Towers. So there's going to be a wide range of occupations across those. I uh, certainly we can get back to you with details on that, um, but it's it's part of that points bearing system also relates very much, they're, they're called national occupation codes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of the, the federal system identifies every province and territory uses. So within those occupation codes, those higher skill level ones are some of the ones that are targets. So even within the allocations, it will say, you know, for example, so many skilled workers, they have to be, and, and I won't go through the details, but they're just letters and numbers to help identify the level of skill and which job types fall within that. So it is a points-based system, so it is affected by that. So it's already screened to cover some of those highly skilled ones, for example, within a skilled worker stream. So yes, it's already designed to capture some of that, but um, I'll turn it over to Suzanne, if I may, Mr. Chair, um, to speak to direct experience most recently. Mm -hmm. Ms. Lay. Hi, thanks. So I can't tell you exactly offhand the number of doctors in, in the program, but certainly, it, as Deputy mentioned, it's a wide range of occupations, high skill, low skill. Um, our skilled worker stream is the only one, uh, the only pathway in Nova Scotia for NOCD, so the, the lowest um, uh, skill in the, in the national occupation classification. Um, but one of the things that I just wanted to mention to your previous question is immigration is fairly complex. We recognize even our streams, uh, we have four active ones and each of them have different criteria. Uh, the process generally is the same or similar and we have guides that will help folks through that. But we also uh, work, we will come to anyone anywhere uh, in Nova Scotia if there are questions, if folks need a 101 uh, uh, you know, presentation on how the system works and how you work with people in you com your community to direct them to us. Okay, no, that, that's fine. I guess, I guess what I was getting at with the doctors, is there any, is there any additional energy being put into uh, recruiting doctors to the province through the immigration streams available? And I guess what I'm hearing is no. Uh, Ms. Towers. So there would certainly health care. Remember, it's not just doctors. That would include things like continuing care workers. And so there are targeted aspects into that healthcare sector, um, not only within the existing pathways, but remember I spoke about the Atlantic Workforce Strategy and the pilot over the next three years? That is another area where we're working right now on where are those demand occupations, and uh, healthcare will be one of them again. And so that's very much the opportunity to increase that targeting certain needed occupations down the road but as, as we sit here today like has yeah. anyone from the Department of Health came to you and said hey we need more doctors can you help us get more doctors is any of that taking place or is it kind of not so we work very tightly with labor and advanced education on what are those occupations that are in demand. Um, and so they're always working to find out where there's gaps, not only in healthcare, but in anything else. Um, and so that's the kind of information we can uh, track down for you. But it's not always what people um, assume it is. It can be someone within the healthcare system, but it might not, it might be paramedics. It may not be doctors specifically. And so that's why I think it's important to go back to that database and then say, here's what's been identified within the healthcare profession itself as the areas that they need. Okay, okay thank you. But so, I mean, the, the um I'm just curious because the, the doctor shortage is, mm -hmm. is something that's been in the media a lot mm -hmm. for, for months now, but, mm -hmm. and I was, just, I was just curious if that's, if anyone in, in, in the Office of Immigration or Department of Health or anyone said, hey, maybe we should be looking for more doctors through this uh, avenue and put some resources and energy into that, but I guess no, it's, it is what it is. Unless Department of Labor and Advanced Education says to the Office of Immigration, here is a, here's a profession that that's in short supply and we need to look at. And that even really hasn't happened from what I take from you other, outside of what, there's no additional uh, effort being placed. I guess that's a fair summary on my part, is it? 
So I think it's really important, even though we're getting data through labor and advanced education, remember they get their information from the businesses and the sectors themselves. Because it's really important to know the people that will be employing, um, what do they need? And, and that generates where are the gaps or where are the areas in which we need to target. And that's why I think it's really important to go back to that, um, not what we're maybe hearing about, um, but what are those actual numbers? What are the known gaps by the people that are trying to hire folks? What is it that they're not finding? The Department of Health has a physician recruitment team. Have they come, has that team reached out to you for help? Do you Ms. Lay, or Ms. Lay? Thanks. So um, we typically hear from, we, we do work with them and we work with other organizations that are recruiting doctors. Um, and we hear from them typically when, when they come to a point where they're trying to hire an immigrant. So they've identified somebody that they're trying to navigate the system and bring through a pathway. And so that, as Deputy Towers mentioned earlier, that's where we'll work with them to say, you know, the skilled worker stream really is your best avenue. Or we think you'll go faster through a federal program, so we recommend you go there. Um, so that's really how we work with them. It's, it's based on a, a supply uh, or a demand driven kind of model. Mr. Houston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I would ask very specifically then, is that, to me, that seems like that would be an area where they're coming to you all the time and saying, here's, I would hope, there, here's a physician we want to hire, can you help us? Is there, is there a whole bunch of active files in between, between the Department of Health and, and you guys now at this stage? So we can look into that for you. As I said, I'm not sure how many doctors are in are in our inventory or are have been nominated this year, but it's certainly data we can look okay. into. Okay, okay. Let's go back to in terms of uh, settlements funding. There's a lot of there's you know, f I guess 14 million in the province that goes into settlement funding projects. Now the um, the College of Physicians and Surgeons used to have a, a program that helped immigrant doctors start working in the province and that that program was cancelled by the college in 2014 so is your office working to help them re-establish any type of a program that would be specifically targeted to helping physicians work in the province or is that um, something that your office would not be actively involved in Ms. Towers we have not been approached by the college um, asking about that, to my knowledge. Um, I'll check on that for you. Um, but we have not been approached on any specific labor needs that way. Um, it tends to be very much individual businesses reaching out to our business officers saying, this is what I need. And it can be anything from metal workers to um, continuing care workers. There's a huge range. But remember, in Nova Scotia, a lot of our businesses tend to be small and medium sized. So it might be one position of one type or two positions of another type. Um, but to my knowledge, no one's asked specifically about that particular one. Um, I will ask, uh, Chair, maybe uh, if Suzanne has heard of anything, but not to my knowledge. Ms. Lay. Ms. Mm. Lay. Thank you. Um, so my understanding, I, I was aware that the program was cancelled in 2014 and at the time that they were looking to go toward a national model, so uh, aligning with other organizations across the country, uh, similar uh, to what we talked about earlier to making sure that international mobility is one of the areas that we're concerned about but making sure people can move across provinces as well. Okay, thank you. In terms of the, um, in terms of the funding, I'll talk about the six million from the province, and I do have the table. So thank you. Uh, I, I don't see any, um, any. Uh, there's a lot of continuity in, in this year from year, same same organizations year over year. There's some movement, but, but and there doesn't appear to any to be any for profit um, organizations on that list. So I just wanted to just specifically know is that it's not because they're excluded. It's just because they haven't put a, a program forward that you've approved? Ms. Uh, Lay. That's right. So um, there's this, there are one or two each year that we don't fund um, typically, um, but generally we're working with organizations that have capacity, that they've been doing this for a number of years. ISANS, for instance, has been doing settlement for, <clears throat> excuse me, 20 years or longer, 30 years, uh, mm -hmm. longer than 30 years. Um, uh, so it's not, like you say, it's not that um, they're excluded in any way. Uh, sure. Yep. 
Okay, so in terms of the in terms of the funding, so the 14 million in settlement funding comes into the province from the federal government and provincial provincial sources, and we have roughly 3,000 immigrants a year, I guess. So we have 14 million dollar pot providing services for 3,000 people a year. How do you assess the uh, whether? How do you assess the effectiveness of the spending of that pot? Like, is it just retention of immigrants in the province after some period of time, or how are, how are you assessing it? It, it, it like 14 million for 3,000 people seems like it should be able to provide some pretty good settlement services uh, for the volume of traffic that they'd be having. So how do you? But how do you assess the effectiveness of that, of that spend? Ms. Towers. Okay, so remember we talked about the service agreements with the different organizations. So when they're asked and they bring forward a proposal of what they can provide, um, it includes an evaluation component that they intend and are expected to do um, and that we follow up on. So that includes um, a financial evaluation. So there's quarterly check-ins. What are they spending? What's getting accomplished? How many clients are being reached? against their proposal of what they were intended, their, their outcomes. They have to be very clear outcomes and see how well they're doing against that. Um, and so that's each year, each agreement. And again, the track records of those organizations over time um, is very much known um, that they are consistent, that they are producing. They, and that's, that, so the outcomes may be measured a, a number of ways. It can be in, for example, the language services. So, so are they meeting language benchmarks? Because if they're delivering those services, they have to meet those language benchmarks in order to be able to apply to be permanent residents, for example, if they may not already be. Um, are you aware of any situations where an organization received funding and then the office determined, well, they didn't meet the outcomes, so therefore we're not going to refund that this year? We're not going to, they're not eligible again. Are you aware of any circumstances where the office has said, gee, that was a program that just didn't meet the outcomes? Are you aware of any of those? So I can s certainly speak to this year. That, that has not been an issue. And to continue as well, remember there's this long-term evaluation because immigration is not just what happens in the first few months or weeks, but it's retention over time, success over time. So it's how many people stay in the province is, is one measure. Um, so that's our evaluating how we're doing as a province as well as how an individual organization is doing on what the outcomes it's to meet. Thank you. We've run out of time. Okay. We'll move to Ms. Ann and the NDP caucus for 14 minutes. Thank you very much. And um, yes, actually, this uh, table uh, of funding by program and organization is very helpful. Um, and I have to just go back and circle back to my f one of my first questions where I said that um, IANS had told us that the, the increase in immigrants has not actually been met with increased provincial funding. Um, and they're, they're finding that difficult. So when I look at that chart, it, it appears that their funding has actually decreased, uh, going from 3,476,000,000 in 2013-14 down to 2,727,000 in um, 2016-17. So is that actually correct, that it's, it's gone down? Ms. Towers. So that's why we provided tables. So you could see the trends over time. Um, so as uh, you know, in any fiscal year, um, in a proposal, an organization may come forward, and what they're proposing to offer that year may be different. So they may be piloting something, trying it out, which may or may not. So there sometimes is, it's not a core funding base. Um, but it's di directly to match what it is they're proposing to accomplish in that year, which they're affected by as well um, in terms of what their capacity is and what they can do. But certainly for the historical side, um, because I don't have that long-term experience, what I'll do is ask Suzanne to speak to that. Um, but let you know that ISANS, um, certainly as I've been speaking with the different representatives there, their executive director, their board chair, um, they are very organized. They know what they're doing. Um, they have a very good working relationship with the province, which they want to continue. Um, and so they're always 
trying things like their economic development, their bridges to the workforce. So some of those, one of the pilot projects they're trying this year, for example, which would have been funded, um, they're targeting a particular age group within the refugees that they, they know a lot of the younger folks may be covered off in the, the formal school system, but they're concerned about those sort of late teens to early 20s. What can they do specifically with them to keep them engaged? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I mean about programs moving in and out of the sure. system. I, um, I understand that, but I'm just looking and it seems like a steady decrease, yeah. like from 34 million to 29 million to 27 million to, to 27 million 600, to 27, 27. So I'm just wondering why it continues to decrease for, for them in particular. So that's where, um, for some of the historical changes, that's where I'll turn it over to Suzanne to okay. speak to. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I'll, t I'll speak about two things in particular. And as Deputy Towers mentioned, we work really closely with ISANS. I sure. uh, just met with Jerry this week, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and one of two things I think that you'll notice, um, or two things that can sort of, as pieces of context um, that aren't coming with your table, which is just numbers. So two things happened kind of in between 2013-14 and 2015-16. And one of them was this shift uh, from the Canada-Nova Scotia Labour Market Agreement to the Canada-Nova Scotia Job Fund Agreement. And so, um, as Deputy mentioned earlier in our conversation, part of our funding comes from the federal government, uh, ESDC, uh, through Labour and Advanced Education to the province of Nova Scotia. And so the, the model changed from, uh, the program changed essentially between 2013 to 2014, 2014-15, and so we had less to invest uh, in the new uh, program under Job Fund Agreement. Uh, the other piece that I think that's really important to highlight is um, after the regional development authorities closed, ISANS had picked up some of the work that they were doing in terms of immigrant, immigrant navigation, uh, but um, when we looked at our funding for 13-14 and going into 14-15, we really wanted, as Deputy mentioned earlier, to enhance the services across the province, so that regional network of face-to-face uh, -face settlement services. And so some of the work that ISANS had been doing, we shifted that work to the YMCA, and that's where they launched the YREACH program. And so as Deputy mentioned, originally they were in seven locations, now they're in nine. Uh, so moving some of that, that pan-provincial outside of Halifax support from ISANS to the YMCA. Thank you. So you're, you're talking about the regional development agencies that were doing immigration work as well, right? Yes, because I know that CORDA, for instance, in, in Truro, was doing very good work there with the immigration. Um, so you're saying that that then switched to ISANS, but then that got downloaded onto the YMCA? Yeah, so it shifted a bit. Um, it shifted from the RDAs were doing some navigation, um, and in a couple of locations, ISANS picked that up when the RDAs closed, uh, but it wasn't everywhere, and um, mm -hmm. it was sort of bricks and mortar um, where we needed a more kind of pan-provincial uh, outlook. So that's when we partnered, and you'll notice the YMCA's funding changed significantly from 2013 to 2014-15, and that was that shift uh, mm -hmm. and the launch of the YREACH program. Yes, because there were a number of uh, programs across the province that were helping, for instance, in Truro, the, 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 um, the black community that they closed the enhancement, community enhancement office there, and there were several other places that, for women's groups and for, for um, African Nova Scotian affairs that closed, and now the YMCA is picking up that slack. So is this along those same lines? So I can't speak to the other the other organizations closing. I'm not sure. Um, but the YMCA is now. But looking they after. are our YReach partner, and they've got a dedicated YReach coordinator in. Um, I believe she's in Maggie's place in Truro, or he. I'm not sure. Okay, and and how many of them do you have across the province? Nine currently. Oh, not those are the ones that are the nine. Okay, and so is there just one person in each of those nine communities? That's right. Okay, thank you. I was gonna, I wanted to just turn to education um, with, I'm, I'm also the education critic, so I'm curious um, about the support for Syrian students. Um, you know, in the classroom, I know that at the Joseph Howell Elementary School here, they saw an influx of 41 Syrian children in February of this year. And it was a, obviously a sudden increase, but it expanded the school's population by a, a third from its existing 146 students. 
And in a news article, the president of the Nova Scotia Teachers Union said that teachers were struggling to support these 316 Syrians expected in the Halifax Regional School Board this year. So could you please give us an update on how the Office of Immigration is working with the Department of Education to ensure that the teachers at the front lines of integration for the new Nova Scotians uh, have the proper resources and supports that they actually need. Ms. Towers. So it's um, there's actually two ways. The Office of Immigration is certainly working with our provincial counterparts at education, um, but also nationally. So I'll, I'll speak a bit to both. So. With, as everyone knows, that was such a compressed time period to move everyone in, and we were learning as we went, um, not only in Nova Scotia, but across the country. And so I'll find out for you some specific numbers, but I know that the school boards and the department worked to put those extra supports in place. Um, I just don't remember off the top of my head some of the numbers, so I'll track that down for you. Um, it, because it was particularly in those uh, initial months and that initial year, um, language was one of the biggest issues. And so a lot of that um, is done through the settlement funding as well, the Teaching Immigrants English, which is part of the Halifax Regional School Board, but delivered across the province. Um, and that's not only, because this is an important part, as we all know, learning language, it's not just within the formal school system, but some of the programs have been designed to help after school as well. The libraries have been involved in that, doing some programs so that not only the young children who might be in the primary to 12 system, but their parents are going and having conversational activities to try to increase their language supports and their proficiency. Now on the national side, because this is not unique to this province with the influx of the 25,000 refugees, um, there's a lot of work going on with the federal government to find out what are the reasonable level of supports, what has gone in already and what should go in in the future. So that, that's underway now. Uh, thank you. And, and so has there been an increase in funding from then from the Department of Education for the, to cover these new Syrian students? So that's what I'll track down for you because my understanding is that there, uh, the funding, but I'm not sure if it's a reallocation or an increase. And that's what I'd need to check to get the specific numbers and how that was handled for you. Thank you. Um, about the English language training, in an interview with CBC in June, Jerry Mills uh, said that, uh, well, she voiced her concerns about immigrants and refugees settling in Nova Scotia who may have recently graduated from high school, as you said, in their home country. But many recent immigrants aged 18 to 25 miss out on English as second language training offered in the high schools throughout the province, which makes it challenging for this particular segment of the immigrant population to integrate. So in order to find good work and participate in the new communities. So what is the Office of Im Immigration doing to address this gap, the gap in, in training? So that was one of the, uh, you may remember me mentioning, uh, that was something that ISANS was piloting through the funding our office is providing to particularly target that age group and have they come in and they have conversational classes to help them adjust to, to everyday life in Nova Scotia and increase their probability of opportunities, not on the labor force, but also as we know, it, that's a high risk age for anyone, whether they're immigrant or not, to make sure how they can be actively involved in their communities mm -hmm. um, and I know that uh, um, even when I met with ISANS uh, be two months ago just after I started they were struggling because there was such a demand for language they were running about a dozen language classes just trying to get everybody through but they've caught up as of last week they've caught up on that backlog now so they've not only gotten everybody through introductory work um, but the key now is how do those other supporting pieces the conversational classes the library events etc how do those continue to help people continue to develop their language skills that it's not just the basics but to be able to integrate in a daily way? Sure, I, I, I understand that. And, but I do also have to hearken back to the fact that their funding has declined quite dramatically, I would say, from 3,476 in 2013-14 to 2,727 
this year. So I, I would like to know why and wh where those programs have been lost that they were offering. So if you could provide me with that, that would be great. And I think my time is probably up. Thank you. If you're finished, that's fine. We're running down, but uh, you're okay? Yes, that's fine. Okay, we'll move to uh, the Liberal Caucus. Mr. Stroink. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, I guess I kind of want to touch on um, the Ray Ivney report because that was a big catalyst of, of kind of rejigging the, the immigration file to, to where we are today. Um, you know, the immigration, the, the Ray Ivney report recommended that the province attract 7,200 new uh, Nova Scotians to, to our province. Um, and I guess, you know, as of today, um, you know, we've, we have the highest numbers that we've had in 10 years. So, and I guess it just shows no matter what, uh, that, that the program that we're doing and implementing and the hard work that the department is doing is working. Um, can you just share some of those numbers of, of what, what our target is? Because my understanding is we're roughly halfway there this year from, so to, as a Nova Scotian, this is exciting. This is positiveness that we're, we're, that the program and the hard work that your department and everybody is doing is working. Ms. Towers. So that's very much, this is where everyone plays a role in this province. You know, uh, not only about being welcoming, as we spoke about, the labor market, all those pieces, how do those contribute? Um, within the target, um, it's not only what um, we may set as a target, and I think it's important to have targets, uh, whether they're aspirational and how realistic they may be, but that for Nova Scotia, this is very realistic. Um, that was a target by 2020, I believe. Um, and so we're on track very much, not only by maximizing all our existing streams, um, trying to find the best fit for folks, so that I th we, d we did speak earlier a little bit about the numbers of landings, which is a reflection of how many people we end up with here in the province. So if last year we had 3,403 people arrive in Nova Scotia, and this year that we just received the numbers and we're, we were at 3,418, I believe it is, for January to June. So already for the first six months of the year, that is you know, more than half of that target. Um, we're always going to be limited to some part or, um, by the federal, but that's why we keep pushing that federal cap up. But because the landings are going up, that is a reflection that we are getting there. That is a realistic target. We are going towards what uh, the Ivany Commission identified as, as a direction that the province needs. And, mm -hmm. I, and I guess that's, that's also a reflection on the department going to the federal government with a plan and not just going out with a handout. And I guess if, if you wouldn't mind speaking to a bit of that, because I think that's where the hard work has really come to from mm -hmm. the province of Nova Scotia and your department and going to the feds and saying, you know, in the past it's been done like this, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So this, this new process, this is what we want to do. This is how we're going to increase our numbers. Um, if you wouldn't mind just speaking a bit to that. And that's where everyone has a voice. If everyone, when they have an opportunity, speaking to a federal colleague to reinforce that Nova Scotia is open to immigration, that's the awareness aspect. But to your point, it's very much also about the credibility. Nova Scotia's had to build its credibility that we can and will welcome immigrants and that we know how to do it and we'll do it in a business-like way. We'll be thorough in our screening, um, but we'll also make sure not only that we can bring people here that go through that screening, but that they stay here, they contribute here. Um, and that's, I think, what the office, and I'm really lucky because I've inherited working at a, a group that um, has been very focused. It's a focused vision, it's focused procedures, um, and that is paying off, and we're seeing that. But we have to keep up that momentum, and everybody has to contribute to that going forward. So, so and I guess with that, um, with that mind, with past governments and this government, I mean, we're, we've created new streams to allow new immigrants to come in. So what are, what are some of those new streams and how many new streams did we enter, did we bring it forward um, into this discussion to increase our population? Okay. So I'll, I'll speak to some of the most recent ones and then um, I'll ask Suzanne to speak to some of the changes over time because that's what I mean by building credibility. What works well and what doesn't work well and how do you uh, build continuous improvement? 
So uh, certainly in this past year, uh, the most uh, immediate streams that have been introduced are around the entrepreneurship. Because you were, everyone heard, has heard that loud and clear coming out of the Ivany Commission and the Now or Never report is to being about being entrepreneurial, about being creative in various ways. Um, so there's the two streams that business entrepreneur is for people who want to start a business or invest in a business and they have demonstrated entrepreneurial skills, whatever they may be, however they may have applied them. It could be in a range of disciplines and fields. The other one was specific to graduates, the international graduate entrepreneur stream. So those are the two that have most recently started. Um, but remember, it's it's all of those streams, the skilled worker, the family, they all contribute. And for most people to even want to come to make that move, immigrants by their very nature are risk takers. Those of us who change provinces, change jobs, change countries, we're risk takers. And that's what also is that entrepreneurial spirit that they were trying to get at. And so I think that's very much the opportunity that, that we can build on and that we're seeing. And um, it's going to be very helpful for everyone, I think, to show how that's getting reflected in how people are contributing in communities, how they're contributing in the labor force. That'll be a very important part of it. Um, I've been talking quite a bit, Chair, so maybe I'll ask Suzanne if I've missed any points that she could add to some of those questions. Sure, ahead, Ms. Lay. Great, thank you. So just uh, two things um, to start, and then I'll go into some of the streams. But um, So I started in, in the department in, uh, I've lost my years, 2014, I guess. And so two key things that I think were driving our work, or have been driving our work since then. One is that we need to demonstrate success. So to your point about um, talking to the federal government about increasing numbers, that only works if we're doing it well. So increasing program integrity, we've hired program integrity staff who have a police background, um, you know, that can do the, the fraud checks, misrepresentation, all of that kind of stuff, quality assurance. Um, we've also filled our allocation every year and we've gone back to the federal government at the end of the year and said we're ready for, we can take more even this year. Um, and the other piece that I think that's really important that um, we wanted to be nimble and responsive. And so if you're, if you're an immigration lawyer, you may think that that's a bit annoying because our forms change, our programs change, um, but we've been responding uh, to needs. So one of the first things that we did in 2014 was change the skilled worker stream. And it was a minor, minor change that we negotiated with the federal government, but it allowed international students, international graduates to apply to the program. Prior to that, they could only go to the federal government. And then 2015, as Deputy mentioned earlier, we were the first province in Canada to take advantage of the Federal Express Entry System, which meant more nominations, faster processing, and a new stream to add to our, our program. And then we were monitoring how that was going, and about two months into Express Entry, we were hearing from employers, major employers like IBM, um, banks, Grant Thornton, and our university presidents and our immigration lawyers that there was a gap in the system and so very quickly we, we responded with a second express entry stream which has been highly successful for people who have work experience so uh, international graduates temporary foreign workers um, we're processing those files now uh, in a matter of weeks and they get six months processing at the federal level so we've um, to your question we've essentially overhauled the provincial nominee program it looks fundamentally different than it did uh, five years ago six years ago, uh, and as Deputy mentioned, the two most recent streams on uh, the entrepreneur side. Uh, and, that's, and that's very exciting to hear because um, it shows that your hard work is paying off and it's incredibly hard for, for people to be critical of what you're doing because the numbers show that the work that you're doing is positive and it is, and, and I can understand the frustration for some people that it, it works and they can't be negative about it and that's, and that's a great thing. The other, my other question um, to you really was the other aspect of the Ray Ivney report was recommending that the province retain 10% of its, of its international graduates. And so that works out to, you know, that's about 7,000 students that we have in the program right now. And if we can keep 10% of them, that's, that's great. Where are we with that and how are we doing on those numbers? Ms. Towers? So the 
The tag team will start here. I'll, I'll uh, give a quick response and add, uh, ask Suzanne to dig out amongst the paperwork the detailed numbers. But um, we're very much on track with that. Um, I, you, you're correct. It's uh, about 7,000 international students in Nova Scotia. Um, and many of them do. They come here. Um, they like the province, they learn the province, they want to stay here. Um, and so the different streams as much as possible to encourage that. We do a lot of outreach. Our staff go out this time of year to all the universities and colleges to talk about immigration, to get them thinking about it as soon as they get in this province, because I think that's the important part. Get the idea planted as soon as you can. Um, and so we've seen um, the change in numbers, how much it's gone up from, you know, 100, 150, to I think we're about 500 right now students. So well on our way to that 10%, 700 students. So uh, Chair, if I may turn it to Suzanne, she has the specific numbers handy. Ms. Lay. Great, thank you. So um, you were not wrong. Between 2011 and 2014, we were nominating about 150 international graduates per year. Um, and since January of last year until September 10th, when we put this together, um, we nominated 708 international graduates. So it's a bit longer than a year. Um, and of those 708, uh, it's interesting to note that 427 of them are grads from programs in Nova Scotia, um, but we're, we've also attracted 281 international student graduates from other universities in the country as well. Well, that's, that's very exciting. Congratulations. <laughs> um, that kind of ends my questions there, but I do want to uh, just uh, commend you from all, from all Nova Scotians, the hard work uh, that you've done uh, for the province is, is phenomenal, and it, and it, and uh, so part of that, uh, by saying thanks from everybody, we uh, we appreciate your hard work and keep going because we need more people, and you're doing the right things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stroink, uh, and thank you, Ms. Towers and Ms. Lay. I'll give you a chance to provide some closing comments. I'll be very brief. I think uh, it's been a good discussion and opportunity to share information on the system. We'll follow up on some of the requests and uh, track down information for you. Um, I would encourage you, um, remember I mentioned about the, the community fund, um, so that even though we have had a number of applications, there is still money in that fund. Um, maybe if it's uh, uh, useful, we can send that direct link to all MLAs, to, just as a reminder to encourage uh, organizations that you speak to, to do that, that's very much part of that welcoming province that we need to move forward on. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Mrs. Towers. And uh, we, will, we do have some items on the agenda. We will begin with uh, information requested from our June 8th meeting. We had a response from the Auditor General's office. Uh, the question was about the timelines for the species at risk audit. And the applicable dates were April 1st, 2013 to September 30th, 2015. That was the uh, report done on uh, species at risk by the Auditor General through the Department of Natural Resources. Any questions on that item? Uh, just, uh, it's more of an information item. It's more of an, in everybody had received the correspondence, so I'm just doing a review of, of items, so. But if, certainly if you have a question, I don't want to interfere if you have a question. It can be for the Auditor General or if you like. Okay, okay. Ms. Zan has a question for the Auditor General. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, um, I'm sorry that it's, it doesn't seem to be getting on our schedule at this point in time, but um, were there any particular I issues with, r around that particular, inf uh, that, that particular issue that you would like to get on the record um, about what has been going on with the endangered species here in Nova Scotia? Because I know there, there have been some different news reports, but could you maybe briefly sum it up for us? Mr. Pickup. Uh, I can sum, up, sum it up for you in a couple of sentences without it being in front of me. So overall, I would say the, the gist of the conclusions were not positive, uh, that the work wasn't being done as planned uh, by the department, and they acknowledged that as well. So I certainly think species at risk, given how critical it is to the lifestyle of Nova Scotia, to the economy and everything else, um, that the results were significant. Um, and this issue has picked up some traction across across the country. So I think it would be a valuable um, topic 
if, you, if that's what you're asking me. Ms. Ann? Thank you, yes, and um, I would say that in light of also new developments where there's now the cap has been taken off the clear cutting in across the province and also this whole glyphosate spraying, which I've been very vocal about, I, I do have major concerns about animals, wildlife in Nova Scotia, but in particular as well endangered species, not to mention the whole Alton gas situation with the um, striped bass there. So um, I believe we'll probably all be watching to see what actually happens when that brining process begins. Um, do you have any, any comments about anything, any of that, that nature? I think I would just comment on the report, and it, it's more than sort of endangered species. It's mm -hmm. threatened, endangered, mm -hmm. uh, extirpated, and extinct. So there's four key classifications of it. Right. Um, all of which I think are important, and uh, you know, many cases once they're gone, they're gone once they exactly. get to that last category. So I, know. I think it's an important topic. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Miss Ann. Uh, the next item is relates to the Auditor General's business plan for 2016-2017 and on July 5th that was distributed to uh, committee members. Um, any questions on that item? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next. Oh, sorry, Mr. Pickup would like to make a comment on the business plan. I will uh, put it under the idea of the business plan, but it's a, a quick uh, comment. We, I share, I started sharing forward what audits were doing, and I just want to let members know that we're now at a point where I can share the spring of 17 reports that we'll be working on, so probably May time. So we are doing uh, climate change. And mm -hmm. that's part of a national audit, all 10 Auditor Generals uh, in Canada and the Federal Commissioner of Environment. And that's looking at mitigation and adaptation, so climate change. Uh, another one in the environment area, looking at uh, how the province is doing in environmental assessments. And then two audits in the health area, one on the provision of mental health services and how effective that is. And the other on physician planning um, within Nova Scotia and looking at um, you know, that situation. Thank you. Any questions? Hearing none. Next item we have is uh, on June 1st, we had a meeting with Service Nova Scotia where the topic of alternative service delivery was discussed. That was for the land registry, the registry of joint stock companies, and the registry of motor vehicles. Um, since then, uh, we have been provided um, on June 22nd with a, um, a copy of the report on alternative service delivery that was prepared by Ernst & Young. Uh, so that has been provided to the committee. Any questions on that item? Hearing none, we move on. Uh, Mr. Houston, you had made a request for a, uh, an emergency meeting. Um, that was dated July 27th, and the purpose was to examine the hiring practices of the Executive Council Office and the Public Service Commission. Um, is that something you wish to, uh, we have it on as an agenda item because it was asked for at the time and wanted to bring it for the committee. Did you have any um, thing you'd like to say about that request? So at this stage, Mr. Chair, I guess we'd have to bring that as a, as a full topic. Is that, is that, would that be an option? That would be the, certainly the preferred route to bring it to the subcommittee. Okay. I'll take it back to my caucus and discuss because I know HR is doing some stuff in that area too now. So. Okay. So I think for the moment we can we can take it off this agenda. Okay. Um, and uh, if I bring it back, I'll bring it back at the subcommittee on agenda setting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item and last item is the uh, Department of Business uh, with the Jobs Fund. And uh, as you'll recall, we had a meeting. Um, We had a meeting with uh, the Department of Business and uh, it was October 28th, 2015. And the request, uh, request was for uh, information on the jobs fund. At the time, it was uh, communicated by the department that it would cost a lot of money to put together the information. We also agreed at that time that we would wait for the annual report, uh, which we have received, and that was distributed uh, to committee members um, on uh, around August 18th of this year. So everyone has that report. 
And um, are there any questions on that? Hearing none, is there any other further business to come before the committee? Hearing none, our next meeting is next week, September 21st, where we will have uh, the uh, Chapter 2 of the Auditor General's report. Um, we will have a, sorry, a briefing that morning on Chapter 2 of the Auditor General's June report on hospital system capacity, followed by our regular meeting at 9 a.m. with the Department of Business to discuss rural internet access. Uh, with that, we are stand adjourned. Thank you.